ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Great Centre. And welcome to the book reading, Nikos, in Kazantzakis, by Howard Dawson. My name is Christina Panagiotopoulos, and I'll be your hostess for this afternoon. Please welcome on stage Mr. John Georgiou, Melbourne President of the International Society of Friends of Nikos Kazantzakis. I am not the international president, I'm only the president of the Melbourne branch, and there are about 200 branches worldwide. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the verb to minister derives from the Latin and has the root meaning to serve. The essential nature of ministry is clearly exemplified in the life and work of Dr. Francis McNabb, through his contemporary roles as Minister of St. Michael's United Church, formerly the, 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 the Collins Street Independent Church, and founder and executive director of the Kerr Miller Institute, centered in premises in Burke Road, Camberwell. In mid-career, he was greatly attracted to the concepts underlying existentialism, hyparxismos in Greek, as these found expressions in the psychological domain through writers such as Ludwig Biswanger and the theological domain through such as Martin Buber. But any discussion with him about his work will make it clear that he has synthesized the best of all theories within his chosen disciplines and drawn widely from all other areas to formulate his worldview. I first met Dr. McNabb some 15 years ago when I was involved in an effort, one of the many efforts, to establish a Melbourne branch of the International Society of Friends of Nikos Kazantzakis, and I was fortunate to attend one of the talks on Kazantzakis given by Howard Dosner. Dr. McNabb immediately lent me his support. As I recall it, we had a conversation on Kazantzakis and his work, and particularly his spirituality. Importantly, Howard refers to Dr. Francis McNabb as a soul keeper, and you would understand how apt this is from what I told you this afternoon. Thus, ladies and gentlemen, friends of Nikos Kazantzakis, his words and his thoughts, it gives me great pleasure <laughs> to call upon the Reverend Dr. Francis McNabb to present to you Howard F. Dosser's very significant and erudite work Nikos readings in Kazantzakis. Thank you. It's my honor to be invited here today by Howard to be part of the launching of his, of the duo, Nikos Kazantzakis readings and a montage. So where do we begin? I'd like to begin with myself. I, I, You've heard something about me, but more to the occasion. I'm presently supervising the construction, the development of a glass uh, sculpture the size of a football, which will be placed in St. Michael's Church virtually as my last um, contribution to it. This sculpture uh, is a portrayal of, of the pilgrimage of the human being from darkness into light. And so at the bottom of the sculpture is, a, um, is a, the darkness. And then the lights break forth around it with all the stars running into it. It's a magnificent piece and it says something about the philosophy of Cousin Zarkus. Because as you know, he said we start we start from the darkness, the abyss, and we end in the darkness of the abyss. And in between there is that intermission, if you like, that in between this that Martin Buber spoke of, the in between which is called life. How do we live life? 
And so this man, Kelsen Zakris, again and again says, here is life. A quite liberated British theologian called Don Cupid wrote a little book which he called Life, Life. We need to say, we need to see, stop talking all the, the complications of theology and religion and see that when we talk about the basics of religion, we're talking about life. When we're talking about God, we're talking about life, the spirit of life. And Cousin Zacharias uh, portrays that. The other day I presided at the funeral of a person who had had a terrible life, but was a life of huge courage. She'd been a, in a wheelchair for 72 years of her life, but with great courage she lived. And so her family gathered in her home the other day and uh, asked me to give the, the, uh, the eulogy for her passing. It was quite significant because here this person had had one hell of a life and it had shown such courage. And so it reminded me of Cousin Zarkas because he said, I said to the almond tree, what did he say? I said to the almond tree, speak to me of God. And the almond tree blossomed. The other day at the funeral, the family dog sat, stood beside me here. I could have said to the dog, speak to me of God. And that dog would have done his, 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 his work. Because at each, as each member of the family came forward to speak at the funeral, their tribute, the dog would walk with them up to the podium and stand beside them. And then as, as the coffin was wheeled out of the, the home to the hearse, the dog walked behind it. So in a sense, the, God, the dog, the God dog, was a substitute for the almond tree in Cousin uh story. Speak to me of God and the almond tree blossomed. Speak to me of God and the dog said, I'll walk with you. The introductory note, Howard writes these words, to learn of, of Kars and Zarkas is inexorably to learn more of oneself. Did you hear that? I read that several times. Yes, as we read this man, as we read Howard's, Howard's interpretation and paraphrasing of this, this man, this author, we're all enriched. We're all able to see ourselves in a different light. And seeing ourselves in a different light is like being on our spiritual journey, in fact. Because that's one aspect of spirituality, is to see ourselves in a different light. To listen to the words of others and to see ourselves in those words. To pause in the silence and notice that the silence too is a moment. A moment when we can all listen to that moment and be enriched. It's my pleasure to come in these books by Howard Crosser today. Thank you. To Francis McNabb, what can one say after such an address? I'm embarrassed. I wanted to look over my shoulder to see who he was talking about, but felt that I might have embarrassed the person behind me if I'd done so. I was surprised when I received an email from uh, Christina indicating that I had 30 minutes to speak. I had anticipated not speaking at all other than saying thanks to people for all the work they've done in organising today. But with your indulgence, I will take a couple of minutes, no more, to give you some indication of the appeal Kazantzakis has for me. Between 1954 and 1958, I was a resident student in a theological college here in Melbourne, preparing for ordination 
into the congregational ministry. I was a man of faith. It was a genuine faith, held sincerely and deeply. But I was also a man of reason. And there were, in my mind, many, many questions that faith seemed not to have the capacity to answer. Midway through my course, an Englishman named Colin Wilson published a book called The Outsider, which was an instant success around the world. I bought it and devoured it. In it, I was introduced to the concept of alienation and to the strangeness man felt as he tried to manoeuvre his way through life. It was a portrait of man in extremis, a portrait of man in pain, struggling to find meaning, values and significance. I identified myself in the work of Colin Wilson. I too was an outsider, for there were many questions that my mind refused to answer. A year after the publication of The Outsider, I stumbled by accident across a copy of Zorba the Greek, here in a second-hand bookshop in Melbourne. I was instantly drawn to the character of Zorba and to the character of Boss, who appears throughout the book. Boss, of course, is a representative fictional figure for Kazantzakis himself. And so I was drawn to the work of Kazantzakis and quickly devoured as many of his books as I could. Here I found a complement to faith. No more than a complement, I found a component of faith. I found a synthesis between my faith and my reason. If there is anything I would plead of my audience, it would be this. Buy a copy of a Greek uh, version or an English version of a book by Kazantzakis and give it to an English-speaking reader. It seems to me that as Greeks, those of you who are Greeks, can do nothing more for this country, indeed for the world, than to share the ideas of this Cretan giant. I commend his work to you, and I trust those of you who do happen to read my own work on him that you find in it something of small value. Christina, I think it's well and truly time that I got out of the way and let you introduce our speakers. Thanks. So long as I am alive, they will continue within me both in their contradictory ways influencing my thinking and my behaviour. My whole life has been an attempt to reconcile them within myself, seeking the strength of the one and the tenderness of the other, so that the conflict that breaks out within me from time to time may be resolved and harmony established within my heart. Periander Krakakis was my teacher in grade three. What unthinking father gave this the name of Corinth's cruel tyrant to such a weak individual who wore his collar high on his neck to hide the scrofula. I recall his skinny legs like those of a grasshopper and the little handkerchief he had constantly in his hand and into which he surreptitiously spat from time to time. It seemed he was always about to take his last breath. Hour after hour, he drove us almost crazy, separating short from long vowels, distinguishing between acute and circumflex accents. But as he raved on, we tuned into the noises of the street. Vegetable sellers, kaluri lads, the braying of donkeys, laughing women, while we longed for the bell that would give us our freedom. Our eyes remained on the teacher, wiping his brow at his desk, going over and over the grammatical points, desperately trying to make them lodge in our brains. But our minds were elsewhere. Out in the schoolyard, engaged in a war with pebbles. 
It was a game we loved and which often led to our going home with bruised bodies. I was an anguished writer, desperate for deliverance. From the uncertainty within me, I sought to turn darkness into light and I wanted to take hold of inchoate shouts and screams within me and transmute them into genuine human utterances. In my endeavours, I summoned historic personages who had survived horrendous experiences. I, tra I transferred to their courage into my own viscera to enhance the soul's capacity to triumph. And there is also this. Three of God's creations had always fascinated me. The worm that shapes and shifts into a butterfly and the axolotl that leaps upon the pond's water as if trying to tra transcend itself. The worm that creates the silk out of its own viscera always held a mystical attraction for me. As I saw them, they were always powerful symbols of the route my soul sought to take. In this context, I cannot possibly express the delight I felt when I came across a set of ancient balances in a Mycenaean tomb depicting a grub on one tray and a butterfly on the other. I interpreted this grub, Zina longing to become a butterfly, as a universal symbol of, for mankind's most imperative and legitimate duty. God, I understood, makes grubs, which man himself must turn into butterflies. Και βγήκα μέσω. Πού πάμε, ρώτησα. Και το χέρι μου έτρεμε μέσα στη χοντρή του φούχτα. Κοίταξα γύρω μου, ερημιά. Στη γωνιά, δυο τουρκαλάδε πλένονταν στη βρύση και το νερό κοκκίνιζε. Το βάσε. Ναι. Δεν πειράζει. Θα συνηθίσει. Στρίψαμε τη γωνιά, πήραμε κατά την πόρτα του λιμανιού. Ένα σπίτι κάπνιζε ακόμα. Κάπω τι πόρτε ήταν κρεμισμένε, αίματα ακόμα στο κατόφλι. Φτάσαμε στην πλατεία που βρίσκονταν το συλληβάνι με τα λιοντάρια. Πλάι, ο μεγάλο γεροπλάτανο, ο κύριο στάθηκε. Άπλωσε το χέρι του. Κοίτα μου τα. Σήκωσα τα μάτια κατά τον πλάτανο. Έσυρα φωνή. Τρει κρεμασμένοι καμπάνιαζαν, ο ένα πλάι στον άλλο, ξυπόλητοι, με μια κουκαμίσα μονάχα και η γλώσσα τους ήταν πεταμένη έξω, κατά πράσινη. But it is also true that at our birth we commence the effort to be creative, to manufacture, to trans transform matter into life. This has led others to believe that the organism that we experience ourselves to be, these two perspectives clash. The descent toward decomposition and death and the ascent towards composition, life, and eternity. Both notions seem to well up as if from the well of reality itself. To begin with, we are startled by life. We cannot grasp its essence. It seems foreign, some fleeting resistance to the darkness. But as time passes, we begin to suspect that life has no actual commencement, that it is some imperishable energy pervading the universe.